Hello and welcome to the fourth virtual session on the VFS workshop on eVTOL infrastructure. Today's session is on urban and municipality planning and land use. We have four outstanding uh, presenters for you today. I want to first thank our sponsors for this workshop, Gannett Fleming, Deloitte, Uber, and for this session in particular, PSNS. And I will now give Mr. Chuck Clauser a couple of seconds to do a public service announcement. So Chuck. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, briefly, just a little bit about uh, PSNS, more formally Paulo Sokolowski and Sartor. We're a 260-person architectural, engineering, and environmental design firm. Headquarters are up in Warren, New Jersey, and we have seven regional offices throughout New Jersey and downstate New York. Uh, business sectors we serve include education, energy and utility, healthcare, public works, real estate, and science and technology, which is where our urban air task force is positioned. Uh, typically, our services include um, architecture and interior design, several types of engineering, including civil and land planning, survey, GIS, structural, mechanical, and electrical, and water resources, the host of environmental sciences, and finally, energy services. So in-house, we offer a single source for fully integrated uh, design and engineering for a wide variety of building and site projects. And we're extremely proud to sponsor uh, today's session. And thanks goes to uh, Vertical Flight Society for this opportunity. Back to you, Jim. Great. Thank you, Chuck. We appreciate your support for the event. And with that, we'll go ahead. Uh, I'll do a, a very short uh, background on the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, it was founded in 1943 as the American Helicopter Society. We, we cover everything from VTOL, uh, uh, micro air vehicles, unmanned systems to helicopters and eVTOL and Stovall basically everything vertical except rockets. Uh, our mission is to advance uh, and educate the, uh, uh, the industry for vertical flight. Um, and we have <clears throat> great support from around the industry, both large, uh, large businesses and small. Um, in 2015, we started the electric VTOL news site, eVTOL.news and where we've captured the, uh, the eVTOL aircraft directory. And as of March 5th, which I realize is a little dated, um, we had 270 aircraft category, uh, catalog on that site in uh, various different categories. Um, I'm sure that uh, as you go there, you will find that these numbers have been updated in the last two months to be well over 275. We also have over 200 uh, articles, and I think I've been corrected to say that's 250 plus articles on the site, as well as a number of other features, including timelines, maps, company directories, and video resources. We also have a number of other online resources, including our, our social media sites. Uh, I'll let you collect those for, uh, for your viewing later. And with that, we'll go ahead and we'll start the main program. So as I mentioned, we have uh, four outstanding speakers and one outstanding moderator for today. And I will go ahead and introduce our moderator for today, who is Yolanka Wolf. Yolanka is the co-executive director of the Community Air Mobility Initiative. Uh, prior to joining CAMI, she was the sustainable aviation consultant for 10 years, working with industry, government, academia, and nonprofits on policy standards and regulations industry development, market challenges, communications, and media relations. She is a business attorney and consultant for over two years, or with over two decades of experience in successful development, implementation of management, and mission-driven programs. She has experience in sustainable transport and land use, and serves as the executive director of CAFE Foundation, where she organizes the annual electric aircraft symposium. Yolanka? Thanks, Jim. Um, and good morning, everybody. I'm uh, really excited to moderate this panel. Um, and uh, before I, we get going, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the Community Air Mobility Initiative, uh, where I serve as co-executive director. Uh, CAMI, as we call it, is a uh, relatively new nonprofit educational organization. We, we stood up last year, although my co-executive director and I 
have uh, have been in this industry for quite a while. Um, our mission is to uh, support the responsible integration of the third dimension into urban and metropolitan uh, tr uh, transportation. So our, our focus is the state and local level. We develop uh, resources, uh, educational materials. We work with uh, we work with state and local decision makers, transportation planners, airports, uh, the media, and the public to uh, educate about urban air mobility or advanced air mobility. And then we also, going the other direction, work with the industry to, to help them understand the needs and concerns of those uh, local jurisdictions. So if you visit our website, you'll see some of the resources we have. Uh, we just uh, a couple months ago did our first uh, half-day UAM 101 workshop for state and local decision makers, um, and we'll be rolling out uh, a series of webinars over the next couple of months. So I'm really excited to moderate this panel, uh, this whole series uh, that uh, Vertical Flight Society has done is uh, fantastic, focused on the infrastructure, which is uh, really where uh, the aviation uh, aspect of urban air mobility intersects with the communities in which it, it will be implemented. And this section, uh, focuses on urban and municipal, uh, municipal planning and land use. So really getting to, uh, to that, that point where uh, the two meet and um, plan into the implementation of urban air mobility. So with that, I will introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Rick Von Hemmen. Uh, Rick graduated from Virginia Tech in 1982 with a degree in aerospace and ocean engineering. While he has maintained a deep interest in aerospace since graduating, most of his career has been spent in the maritime arena, including naval combat systems, ship classification, yachts design, America's Cup design, and commercial shipping. In 1988, he joined Martin and Ottawa, a marine consulting firm that has been in continuous operation since 1875. The firm provides consulting services to clients all over the world, dealing with maritime engineering, operational and financial issues, and occasionally as related to marine aviation issues. Much of his work is related to forensic engineering, and the firm has been called in on nearly all major maritime disasters in the last 40 years. Rick is a licensed professional engineer and a fellow in the National Academy of Forensic Engineers and the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. He is presently the senior partner and president of Martin in Ottawa. Uh, please welcome Rick. Good morning. Um, it, I, I came into this um, particular presentation um, uh, sort of backwards. I um, First of all, uh, it's pointed out it's land use and if I'm the first speaker and my presentation actually is not about land use, it's considerations for waterborne infrastructure. And um, uh, when, when I was first um, asked to do this presentation, I was not fully aware it was about eVTOL. I thought it was straight VTOL in which we've had um, uh, more than occasional involvement with regard to the interaction of helicopters and water-based uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, generally, the water-based infrastructure then relates to um, the, the classic question where can we use a helicopter uh, on the water? And, and that in its own way is easy because we've, um, we generally use um, uh, helicopters on board ships and it's a very traditional use case. Uh, they belong together and um, uh, th th there's almost no reason to further discuss this. Um, uh, we have the full born helipads on, um, on, on ships and then we also have, uh, we, uh, or we have the uh, occasional use uh, on on um, on floating objects and uh, the occasional use nowadays is very commonly involved with yachts where every, almost every yacht is a helipad, but they don't have necessarily a, um, a, a helicopter they carry around. Um, uh, our involvement on a commercial basis actually is not so much related to the traditional use; it's more commonly related to um, the lack of land infrastructure. So what happens is we get called by uh, various helicopter operators who say 
while I operate out of New York City or Miami or other urban areas. And um, I, it's very difficult for me to land my helicopter on the ground. And I'd like to land it on the, um, uh, maybe on some asset that is waterborne. And when you do that, you end up with lots of um, uh, unusual uh, problems and they become actually very complicated. And um, I, I will provide an outline in this presentation, mostly because we did write it up, but um, uh, the, uh, uh, the real reason for it is that it also kind of uh, shines a light on the EV toll situation, uh, where if you stay within a certain constraints, you won't have that much of a problem. This is the question, um, you know, we let, can we float it off, can we float it somewhere? And then the next question is, well, being a float one, can we float many, which um, brings its own uh, complications and problems. Um, in, in these experiments, or experiments, this may be the right word, in these efforts where we have um, provided this type of systems for maritime-based uh, landing infrastructure, um, we, um, we, we generally almost immediately encounter the problem of, um, of what a ship is. And the reason for that is because the moment you move passengers and cargo on a floating object, it very quickly becomes a ship. And when something becomes a ship, it very quickly becomes involved in regulatory issues, which in the United States are um, sort of split. There is the commercial regulatory uh, agency, it's called the American Bureau of Shipping, which um, has its own rules for helicopter decks and facilities. And um, uh, they, they are pretty much the universal helicopter deck and facilities on board ships and also on drill rigs. Um, uh, this is a public document, you can download it and take a look at it. And it goes anywhere from touch and go to a full, basically, a heliport on a ship. Um, a ship is part of the country of the flag that it flies. And if you're going to operate in the United States, you're pretty much stuck with US flag, which mean, then means that the US Coast Guard has jurisdiction. And um, I can go through the complication of what a ship is, but it's not uh, necessary for this presentation right now. It's just important to remember that if you have less than six paying passengers, um, the Coast Guard becomes substantially less interested in what, um, uh, what, in, in what goes on aboard that ship. In other words, it becomes more of an unregulated ship. If you have more than six passengers, you have to deal with the code of figure re regulations. When it's less than six passengers, you're pretty much outside of it, as long as you have some life jackets and simple safety equipment on board. Now, the Coast Guard controls navigable waters. There are also non-navigable waters in the United States. Um, and an enclosed lake is a non-navigable water. A navigable water is generally a place that a ship from the ocean can get to um, uh, while going up a river and through locks and sometimes other locations. Uh, there are a lot of nav uh, non-navigable waters in the United States. A good example is Lake George, which is um, upstate New York. Uh, there, there are passenger vessels on that lake, but they're state regulated, although they pretty much use the Coast Guard regulations, and they will often refer to Coast Guard regulations, and actually state laws that control it. Then Lake Champlain is navigable because it has a section of the Erie Canal that goes through it, and there the Coast Guard is in charge. Um, states can individually restrict flight ops on lakes, and a state, it's very difficult for states to do that on navigable waters. So in the Adirondacks, which is upstate New York, it's a huge park, there are certain lakes that simply are excluded from airborne operations, whether it's VTOL, eVTOL, or, um, or today almost even drones too, there's pushback against drones too. Um, um, the, um, some states don't even know what it means to have navigable waters. I've dealt in a project in Oklahoma where they couldn't even come up um, with any regulations within their state, and they just said, well, do the best you can. Um, when you start to talk about these marine landing facilities, um, you have to deal with some options. And, and the first thing uh, that you might look at is if you have no more than six passengers on the marine facility, it is pretty much FAA. The Coast Guard does not get involved. In other words, you see that little float in the picture there. Um, if you have um, uh, less than six passenger operation, in, in the first instance, there's little anybody can do to prevent you from landing there, as long as it's within FAA requirements. But then if you go on and say, well, I need to carry more passengers, then you have to make some choices. And these choices are either a full Coast Guard approved US flag vessel with an approved helicopter facility, or you can do a barge that's tied up somewhere, or you can do a barge that's anchored somewhere and then have a transfer vessel that takes you to the shore. You can build a pier, 
or you can do a platform which would be a pier that's not connected to the shore or if you're really tricky you might be able to pull off some stuff with foreign flag vessels but that is probably no less complicated than having a fully u.s flagged vessel so i can go through all these details um, but there, there is not enough time for that so i what i will do is i will kind of flip through them so you look at the pictures there um, you can see a the uh, full coast guard approved vessel um, is is easily doable um, easily being relative it's it's all documented people know how to do it but the problem with it is that you cannot permanently tie it up because then it becomes something else so if i want to anchor permanently anchor or permanently tie up a fully um, coast guarded vessel that has a helicopter facility and start to use it commercially then um, i have to go through some additional problems and these problems are the problems that occur when you for example when you use a barge and um, uh, tying up something permanently then gets involved in environmental factors and and um, and site planning and things like that so you can also anchor the barge somewhere and anchorage is actually strangely you can pretty much anchor anywhere but you can't anchor permanently anywhere and you can only anchor in permanent anchorages and to permanently anchor in a permanent anchorage you actually have to get an uh, anchorage permit from the u.s army corps of engineers through the coast guard it becomes quite complicated um, you can do a pier uh, you can build a pier and once you build a pier um, uh, you can land helicopters on it, but then it becomes basically an extension of the land, and you have to use a, um, um, you have to go through um, the federal and uh, local approval processes as, as an ex extension of the land. You build a platform somewhere um, uh, if you own submerged land, but there's not a lot of land out there. Uh, most of the platforms are built on leased land, um, and of course, offshore you have offshore helicopter pads, like the picture shows. So you can use a foreign, a foreign flag vessel and you can get away with that for a couple of couple of days, probably. And then at a certain stage, the um, Jones Act issues come in place and Jones Act issues are related to the transport of passengers and cargo between U.S. ports. So if I move somebody on a foreign flag vessel between even a very short distance between uh, Hoboken, New Jersey and Manhattan, um, I can only do that on a Jones Act vessel, which is a U.S. flag and U.S. built vessel. You can't do that with a foreign vessel. Now, if I have a foreign vessel that's tied up in Manhattan and a helicopter takes off and it flies to uh, Hoboken and lands in a Hoboken licensed facility, then um, I can do that for, for a while until somebody starts to take notice. Um, and then there are two ways to, to kind of put the pressure on. One is that a Coast Guard has what is called port state inspection rights. Coast Guard can board any vessel in the United States and see if they like what they see. And if they don't like what they see, they can basically stop the operation of that vessel. So um, this was about, this presentation so far, it was about pilots flying helicopters and people taking tickets and, and, and taking passages from one spot to another. But now we're getting into the autonomous game and the autonomous game uh, becomes then also a private game and uh, private aviation um, um, as far as landing on the water is concerned is actually easier than uh, commercial av av aviation which we basically all know but it is just the easy way to do it um, so if there are actually no passengers for hire the government takes little interest as to where you park your vehicle on the water and um, uh, you could in theory own a house on the water and have a barge tied up over there land your helicopter on the barge and then use a, a launch to take you from the barge to the to the shore and in theory nobody can object to that except as long as but in faa requirements the same as land-based requirements so as nobody can object to that as long as um you um uh, you don't have your neighbors that start to complain and um, the community complaints could be a big deal um, and, and we have had to maneuver with those a couple of times. And remarkably, sometimes the community liked it and sometimes the community absolutely didn't want it. Um, as far as I know, there is no defined autonomous vehicle license approach uh, for, for um, uh, water-based operations, probably the best way to put it. Um, but it's not entirely clear how it will work out. Uh, in, in our experience, a small project uh, for autonomous private VTOL vehicles, uh, they uh, should be able to land on the water, which then kind of pushes the amphibious approach. 
And uh, the interesting thing about the amphibious VTOLs is, is that your infrastructure actually becomes much simpler because the infrastructure you've built is no, is, does not become something that is um, a ship. It's simply a ramp. And ramps are much easier to build, or it could be actually a dock that you tie up to. And those particular facilities are actually easier to license than and a facility that has that floats or that is a fixed facility that has people landing on it. So if you land on the water in your amphibious vehicle and you taxi to this, uh, uh, whatever that landing facility would be, um, you should be able to deal with that more easily. And that might actually very well be a solution uh, at some stage in the game. Now we have to remember that some places are still in the Wild West, truly like the Wild West. Alaska has um, uh, purposely kept a huge amount of freedom in, in their operations to ensure that uh, these remote communities um, are supplied. So very often it's the need, it's not the, um, the actual technology that takes over. So um, um, uh, initially I talked about the Coast Guard as Wolf, but um, uh, very quickly, there are other agencies that are going to evolve. One is the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which deals very, very much with um, the, what what takes place on the bottom of the navigable waters. So if you place an anchor or you place a spud, which is a pole that you can march, uh, put a uh, more a barge to, or if you, um, uh, you may build a pier, it's U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that shows up. And um, there could also be state agencies, such as the DEP. I already mentioned that if you make a fixed um, uh, water-based structure, you have to do an environmental impact. Uh, park services are a big deal. Um, uh, they could even uh, have an effect as far as noise infringement on the park is concerned. And then the state governments, local governments, and especially local environmental groups, of course, um, can have a, a say in the situation too. Keep in mind that in places like, and we're all familiar with this, in the Hamptons that um, helicopter uh, flights and and even ferries are very much restricted, not by any official um, um, restrictions, but rather by sheer community pressure. Go to the next slide. The next slide talks about um, some technical stuff. And uh, I think being an engineer, I just want to um, kind of have everybody pinged in on that. Question is, you know, uh, uh, when you have when you land a VTOL on a on a floating object, how big does it need to be? And uh, that depends on the service and where it will be used. And it's really funny. Um, I have seen, um, for example, in the Great Barrier Reef, they land helicopters on um, on barges that are barely bigger than a doormat. And that's okay because it's protected waters, and um, and um, the, the the helicopters you know can be landed within inches in reasonably good flight conditions, and um, there's no problem with them. And on the other hand, uh, you know, the question is, uh, how do you get the passengers on board? And uh, and uh, when do the passengers get aboard? And that can be tricky because when you have uh, some something floating in the water, the passengers get off and uh, they shouldn't fall overboard. They should be able to get on the launch and or go ashore. And that deals with handrail design, lighting design, and uh, safety equipment design, all kinds of things. And then um, um, on flat water, um, as I said, the size is determined by basic stability, but um, the stability is 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 easy to achieve. Helicopter is not that heavy and it can be landed in the middle of the object and stays up uh, all right. But on exposed waters, it becomes a different game. And this is the classic situation where uh, Navy pilots and Coast Guard pilots, of course, are quite familiar with the uh, extreme, extreme situations that occur when even a large vessel starts to move in ocean waves. And then it becomes a, a complex situation where you really need pilot input where they will say, I'm comfortable with this or not. Needs to be remembered that refueling is more complicated in water than on land. And again, as I said, a landing barge can be tiny if you have the right application. So my final slide is the conclusions. I think I stuck to my 15 minutes. Um, it's always important to remember the Coast Guard is not interested in carrying your risk. The Coast Guard will always say, uh, you know, show us what you have in mind and we will judge whether we like your risk. So you have to always end up with risk assessment in one way or another. Uh, design is always location dependent. It's very rare. I can't think of any situation where one size fits all. Um, on the six passengers, you can get away with a lot in the water. And there will always be complications and they show up in, even when experienced people, they show up in places you don't expect. And, you know, keep in mind that many places are dealing with tides and very complex weather conditions. Um, and if the locals want a maritime landing facility, it's easy. And um, 
uh, and uh, when there is um, when they don't, there is not a lot of um, uh, regulation that says, well, we have the right to such a facility. So you kind of have to work with the community. And as I said before, um, I had situations where the community was interested in maritime landing facility, and that was mostly under the guys that said, you know, this can deal with emergency work too when things go wrong. This is a, already a pre a certified place for helicopters to land to deal with things. And then, um, you know, KISS, keep it simple, stupid, but it truly rarely is. And um, I'd certainly like to see that at some time there's some type of national guide or regulation for marine um, landing facilities. And that's certainly something we should look up, look at for, uh, for VTOL also, eVTOL also. And that should be it. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Rick. Uh, that was that was great, and um, I just want to make sure everybody is aware that if you have questions, you can enter them in the questions section. Um, I know people are doing that, uh, but make sure everybody's aware that that uh, that is there. Um, I do see that um, some people have had some issues with uh, connections, and um, just noting that for Jim. Um, to see what he can do about that. I uh, see audios dropping out. In the meantime, I will move on to introduce our next speaker, who is Chuck Clauser. Chuck is a registered architect with 47 years experience and is a senior director with PSNS Architecture and Engineering, headquartered in Warren, New Jersey. Formerly, he was president of CSC Architects and has over 30 years experience in the healthcare sector. Currently, he lead, serves as lead for the company's UAM task force and has developed an urban air mobility operations manual for company reference. In his role, he advises on aviation matters for the company. He is a commercial pilot, flight instructor, and enlisted Navy veteran. He's flown six military aircraft as a, as a civilian pilot, including the Bell AH-1S Cobra helicopter from the Navy's test pilot school for a magazine article he authored. Recently, he was elected to the board of directors for the American Helicopter Museum and Educational Center in West Chester, Pennsylvania. He was also air boss for the Air Victory Museum's four annual air shows at the South Jersey Regional Airport in Lumberton. During that time, he had owned two general aviation aircraft. He's a member of the Vertical Flight Society, the Experimental Aircraft Association, and the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. He plays piano, authored a treatise on music theory, and enjoys painting and kayaking at his home on the Barnegat Bay. I'm not sure what Chuck doesn't do. Uh, please welcome Chuck. Yolanka, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks again to uh, Vertical Flight Society for asking us to uh, participate in this workshop. We just passed the afternoon mark, so good afternoon everyone. It's our privilege to uh, present a high-level overview of architecture as it uh, pertains to uh, urban air. And with such a wide variety of topics having been presented in this series, we elected to focus on uh, those elements of facility design that are both integral to the architectural and engineering process, and uh, also offer some thoughts on things to ponder when considering the creation of a new facility. Now, Uber and Brian Learn coming up next, will cover more of the specific considerations to be given the Vertiport design decision. So we'll stay in the generic camp for uh, our chat with you. So these are the categories we'd like to cover today, again, as a high level overview. So we'll be speaking to a variety of touch points on a number of related topics. So there's no charts or graphs, just mostly a discussion of planning elements. There's a lot to cover, so I apologize in advance if it seems like I'm whizzing through it. So we'll look at a, a quick survey of various facility types we're apt to find in uh, urban air mobility, how the design team is composed and uh, what some of the typical services provided are, an overview of the construction team and some of that community's uh, typical services, a few points on how architecture will uh, intersect with urban air, and a discussion of how and why approvals, architecture, engineering, and high energy electrical are endemic to the creation of uh, vertiports. So uh, these are the, um, vertiports are closely associated with uh, on-demand vertical flight and, um, you know, is championed largely by Uber and can exist either as an all new or as a modified facility. 
we'll see more of this from the Uber discussion coming up next. But then there are various other types of facilities that can be based at individual properties or at regional airports, which have much infrastructure already in place, like MRO facilities, supply chain centers that support the spectrum of uh, vertical aviation. But perhaps among the most important facility would be the city transportation hub, where uh, all types of ground transportation and now vertical transport can be focused. And let's remember that, you know, folks like Daryl Swanson have been advocating for this for a while now. Those uh, companies who will be operating a fleet of EV tolls will need a base of operations ultimately, and perhaps even pilot and staff training centers. And there's potential for a host of other types of facilities that are tangential to urban air as we've been discussing it. Looking at the design team, most design firms are comprised primarily of architects and perhaps interior designers and hire outside engineering consultants. Some like PSNS provide all of these disciplines in-house as uh, integrated services. Some consultants or staff uh, would be civil engineers, which provide land planning and uh, site development engineering, structural engineers, design foundations, building framework, and analyze existing structures uh, to accept new roof loads in the case of a new vertiport. Mechanical engineering covers HVAC, plumbing and sprinkler uh, fire protection, and electrical covers building power, uh, lighting, and various systems networks. Environmental services, if needed, will cover a host of services like, uh, well, environmental impact statements and things of that nature. Um, other types of outside consultants might include uh, specialty services like aviation infrastructure planning, like, like Rex Alexander does, acoustical design, facility-based CNS equipment installation, construction cost estimating, and, uh, and the work CAMI does, for example. Uh, lastly, other business uh, types, as you see here, might become part of the larger facility. And wouldn't it be nice to have a place to eat and shop and maybe uh, attend a conference center and things like that? Next slide is going to cover uh, design team services and fundamentally essential core services would include things like this. A review of the proposed building use or uses and the site of the project, whether it's a, an all new facility, an addition or modification to existing conditions. At existing facilities, a thorough conditions assessment would have to be made to create an informational baseline for the designers. And often the design team will help develop the client's program to bring forth as much pertinent information as possible that maybe the client didn't, didn't think about. Uh, in the early stages of a project, the owner's budget and time schedule will be addressed together with a review of the regs and codes that are uh, affecting the project. Very few basic parameters that serve as signposts start with a definition and organization of all of the appropriate elements for a development project. And from that, the project record would be begun. And very broadly, project phases would include assessment, uh, concept development, contingency planning, formal design work, and final documentation, uh, you know, the plans and specs, preparatory to uh, permitting uh, construction and uh, occupancy. So not part of the design team, general contractors or construction managers provide a number of services in addition to basic construction like pre-designed services which help uh, assess project viability, projected costs, time schedule and other elements might affect construction. Their early input can be very beneficial to a uh, project's viability and we support that. Some firms serve as uh, owner's reps on projects with uh, complicated parts or involving many players. And there are also dedicated construction cost estimating firms and outside project management organizations that assist the owner as well. So most contracting firms are supported by outside subcontractors, material suppliers, uh, specific trade fabricators, equipment vendors, and other specialty groups that all contribute to the construction effort of a project. We prefer to see the builders getting on the contract early in the design stages, which allows the designers and the builders to interface directly in advancing the project with constructability and cost reporting uh, done concurrently. Next, we're gonna be looking at a couple of planning points here. <clears throat> Most of these thoughts have already been discussed many times before, and you'll recognize, and they, they make up a large part of the palette that is defining urban air right now. So while not new, they are nonetheless important, and we need to keep these in the forefront. 
I think we all see urban air as a transformational social system for localized aerial public transport, right? So despite the interest, it's going to be built on perceived need, demand for its services, the promised savings of time, and ultimately be affordable for all users. And our industry must demonstrate very high levels of safety and reliability, including the perception and effects of noise, which we heard about last week. Uh, public acceptance is going to be the lifeblood of successfully operating vertical flight, which also needs to show how it will be serving the greater public good. Urban Air will participate in and perhaps even influence uh, the use of community uh, smart technology. And federal, city, state, and perhaps county approvals will all be based on regulations yet to come for the most part. Uh, location will be dependent on zoning, uh, surrounding airspace and aerial routes, aviation approvals, uh, impact on pedestrian and vehicular traffic, parking, uh, energy requirements, firefighting accessibility, and on and on. And there's a whole host of factors that have to be considered. Probably most importantly, though, is public safety. Planners should develop a well thought out, good neighbor approach before attempting to integrate aerial services in the local urban environment. Good planning. Projected tempo of operations must be assessed not only up at the flight deck, but also down at curbside so that we're not adding to local congestion. And lastly, the critical component will be the availability of uh, high energy electric from the local power company, and that in itself is a full left subject all of, all of its own. The proposed facility and perhaps its site will require appearances before the local planning and zoning boards most likely to determine, among other things, whether the introduction of this new aerial enterprise will change or modify the use group uh, the building was originally permitted for. So following board approvals and preparatory to construction, Various building permits will, of course, be issued, and there may be other permits uh, required as well, depending on the situation. So from an aviation standpoint, Urban Air does not now have any uh, federal regulation in place for any aspect of the organization or licensing or planning or operations, construction or, or, or training for uh, this enterprise. But right now, we're all referencing existing aviation and rotary wing regulations, standards, advisory publications and other, other materials to move ahead with the aircraft and the aviation operational planning. So the references you see listed here are all current regulations that govern uh, fixed and rotary wing operations. Uh, federal agencies are studying where and how urban air will fit into the national airspace system, but their ultimate regulation writing is going to be based on demonstrated testing information and the data you know, provided by the uh, aircraft manufacturers and the systems developers. And, you know, while the FAA works these out, we as an industry can use what would currently exist, but ultimately we'll uh, have to comply with the final adopted regulations. But let's take a look at a few things the design team will have to uh, you know, keep in mind. Initially, we need to understand the requirements of the owner. We'll conceptualize how to compose the numerous elements that are the building program, uh, create three-dimensional environments that make up the design solution and have them be responsive to and reflective of its use in the creation of form and space, have human scale, and have its primary purpose visually evident. As interior space and form emerge, it, it shapes its exterior, and that outer form becomes part of the community's uh, urban landscape. So as a hub under all of the aspects and perceived benefits of urban air, we've already seen that uh, it'll become a vertical extension of our ability to move about more effectively, uh, more cleanly, offering uh, better use of our time and having the added benefit of uh, serving the public good overall. Probably uh, most interesting is seeing our vertiports as urban transportation centers or hubs that bring together a host of amenities that serve the public interest. Uh, so it becomes a kind of a societal engine with a number of parts that would benefit the community. Um, and, you know, having worked through all that's needed, planning has to start at the curbside, as we mentioned, to make sure we're properly accommodating pedestrians and visitors, uh, the general public, vehicular traffic, and parking. Passenger intake uh, needs to be regulated for accommodation, of course, but also with safety and security foremost. Up at the roof level, 
Skyport Terminal provides final security and passenger assistance. Flight deck will be designed for the projected tempo of operations, including arrivals, departures, boarding and deplaning, aircraft parking and charging, uh, maintenance, passenger safety, and perhaps a parking spot for a non-flying uh, eVTOL. We want next to take a real quick look at the uh, vertiport engineering. So the engineering disciplines normally associated uh, with buildings utilities are, are shown here. Uh, careful planning is required where utilities will not be shared with the host building, but instead are brought in and extended uh, to separately serve the vertiport. So early assessment of existing uh, utility capacities are needed to see if utilities can indeed be shared with the host or if all new extensions from their sources are going to be needed. Both cases, of course, will need the uh, owner agreement. So for all the plumbing services, they're, they're all going to have to be assessed uh, to determine uh, each individual capacity and, and whatever potential they may have for extension. Mechanically, most likely, uh, the rooftop vertiport terminal building will have its own dedicated HVAC system and not share the uh, existing buildings. Electrically, uh, this covers oh, general terminal power, lighting, security, fire alarm systems, things like that. The potential, of course, exists for incorporating uh, solar power as well. As far as uh, lease space is concerned, the question of independent extension or shared use of utilities is going to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Another important factor will be how to physically carry utility extensions, whether shared or independent, through the building's host spaces and keep them uh, totally separated. Um, just, just a few thoughts here on uh, high energy electrical. Th this will be an all new service that will include the recharging requirement of primarily the EVTOL aircraft, but also ground vehicles like electric cars and bikes and scooters and perhaps someday buses and jitneys all down at the grade level. We must first and foremost assess the grid structure and determine the availability of electrical services. There's, there's no bigger decision uh, or deal breaker than that. Um, determining electrical power for the incoming service, that, that'll be based primarily on the projected demand and tempo of operations that uh, we're projecting. It's uh, essential to uh, determine re power recharging profile from the aircraft manufacturers. Uh, together with the projected tempo of operations, like I mentioned, either for on-demand or uh, scheduled operations, which have different rates. Uh, and, and such availability is dependent upon local energy company equipment and the current service expansion capability. So early discussions with your energy provider is kind of critical here. Cost, the cost of extending uh, high energy power it would have to be determined between the utility company and uh, the owner, and perhaps the users. Internal distribution will have to be considered uh, really, really carefully, along with how the service gets routed up to the flight deck. You may not be able to be uh, poking all the way through the various uh, floors and levels of somebody else's building. Power calculations are going to be based on managed charging versus the on-demand tempo. Again, uh, different, different rate of consumption. And so lastly, our collective goal from, from all of us involved in, in this advancement of urban air with its unique uh, rates of consumption has to be has to support a sustainable environment, I believe, that does not overburden our energy grid. We should all have a goal of working towards uh, zero emissions. So we've presented a host of talking points that have been geared towards uh, working within a wholly new environment of three-dimensional transport planning. In, in light of the numerous presentations organized by the Vertical Flight Society, there's a myriad of topics that continue to need to be addressed head on and resolved. We have to look at the light side and, and the dark side as well, so that ultimately new standards, regulations, and, and best practices can emerge. Here we covered but a few touch points that we're all going to have to consider moving forward. And there's a great deal of encouragement, I think, to be garnered from all the work that's been developed and presented to date from government and, and from industry. Uh, you know, I see that cooperation has been shown to date as, as remarkable, frankly, and, and we all continue to collaborate and share information. Well, only the better will come of it. I think there's been a, a tremendous outpouring of, of that uh, between the various industries and government and uh, and us from the design community it's uh, really really pretty interesting 
just want to thank everybody for your attention during the presentation and uh, thanks to Yolanka and the Vertical Flight Society to Jim and Rex for sponsoring these topics. And I think through continued cooperation and sharing, we'll be able to realize that this indeed is closer than you think. So Yolanka, thanks again, and it's back to you now. Chuck, thank you so much. That was great. Um, and we will move on to our next presentation. Uh, our presenter is Brian Learn, originally from Ontario, Canada. Brian is a design and development professional with nearly 20 years experience in national program rollout for a variety of companies and industries. Brian has spent time with Tesla Motors, VF Corporation, and most recently, prior to joining Uber, Brian was a director of development for the Western United States at WeWork, leading teams of architects, engineers, designers, and project managers. Brian is now working alongside the incredibly talented and highly experienced team at Uber Elevate, working to create solutions for Skyport infrastructure and urban air mobility. Brian, over to you. Thanks, Yolanka, and, and thanks, you know, again, uh, Jim and Rex and everyone at uh, Vertical Flight Society that's kind of worked to bring this together, and um, I'm happy that we have this uh, opportunity to uh, continue exchanging ideas here, albeit digitally, and, you know, I really look forward to the day that, uh, you know, soon that we get back together and, and can do this in person. So, um, I think I'm, I'm in a really good spot here following uh, Chuck's presentation, um, and I'm going to walk through... Uh, some of the um, some of the things about how we're thinking about Skyport design at Uber Elevate and and kind of tie this back to a lot of the professional services that that Chuck uh, and consultants that that Chuck spoke about. So um, we're going to start with our design principles and, and talk a little bit about you know a few of the elements that guide us as we as we work through early Skyport uh, uh, concept development. Uh, and then we'll touch on the process, you know, of that design and development uh, and where we are today with it. And then uh, we'll dig into to some of the basic Skyport layout assumptions that we're making and, and moving forward with. Uh, and then and then some of their uh, applications and then finish with uh, with very uh, early vehicle uh, interface uh, requirements uh, that we are incorporating into this concept design. So um, broadly at, at Uber Elevate, you know, our vision is we're weaving everyday flight of people and, and things into the existing Uber platform, right? So we do this, you know, a couple of different ways. On, on the right-hand side of this slide, you, you see our, our eVTOL uh, common reference model, uh, as well as our connected Skyports. And, and what we've done is, is we're partnering with, you know, some of the top OEMs uh, and real estate developers in the world uh, who, you know, are, are working together with us and, and building, you know, these capital intensive assets for us. And uh, on the left-hand side, you see the multimodal, you know, aerial ride sharing and, and the automation platform. Uh, and these, you know, uh, at, at Uber, you know, in-house, you know, we're working on these, you know, software and operations that will ultimately power this network. So let's move into, you know, some of the guiding uh, principles. Uh, you know of our of our design and and what I wanted to talk about here a little bit is you know we have six items here you know I wouldn't say that any of these are weighted more heavily than any of the others and you know personally I think all six of these elements you know carry an equal amount of importance and and uh, something that always needs to be forward you know in our in our design development uh, as as we kind of go through this and so um, you know we always you know at Uber absolutely you know across all of our uh, all of our businesses, you know, we are writer and, and obsessed, you know, and customers always first. So when we think about, you know, uh, you know, the new concept that usability and intuitiveness, you know, they need to be built in from the very start. You know, we always think of the full, you know, end to end experience for our, our passenger, our customers. Uh, efficiency. You know, operational efficiency, you know, of these Skyports really, you know, is going to be key to the success of any design. And as we as we move through concepts and 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 um, creating uh, an ideal configuration or what we want to what we want to move forward with uh, an ideal configuration, we need to make sure that we're finding a way to to keep those configurations flexible enough to you know adapt uh, and and you know to any scenario and that's going to help keep it successful uh neighborly 
Um, this, you know, can be a sensitive, you know, subject. We acknowledge that and, and we embrace it. And, and we know because, you know, when we think of the early developments here uh, with Skyport development, we, we look towards, you know, existing infrastructure and what opportunities there may be to repurpose some of that existing infrastructure. And so while we're doing that, we know that there's going to be some community impact. Um, and, and so we have to have, you know, a thoughtful consideration into those impacts. And if, if any, you know, successful integration into an urban or suburban environment, you know, is only going to be through those uh, partnered engagements, you know, with federal and state local regulators and, and, and directly, you know, with the community itself. Cost, you know, um, you know these operational networks of, of skyports that you know are going to be required, they they don't currently exist. You know, we are going to need to develop these network of skyports and vertiports, you know, completely from the ground up. So, you know, uh, thinking about you know designing in a way that's that's also keeping very close attention and an eye to the financial impact of these developments and and making sure that it continues to be a viable uh, viable product. And scalable, you know, just as we keep our focus on cost and efficiency, we need to acknowledge uh, that, you know, as we want and as we need a rapid adoption of this new modality, that that is really is only going to come, you know, if we have maximum adaptability and some sort of regularity and repeatability in our designs and our concepts and our implementations. So as we move from location to location, you know, we cannot start over with with our designs. We need to, you know potentially be able to kind of copy and paste, if you will. So again, that, that flexibility uh, and efficiency, you know, needs to be able to repeat itself. And finally, um, last and certainly by far the least, you know, certifiable. So, you know, while there may not be any sort of official federal guidance specifically for skyports, vertiports, you know, facilities that are planned for EV total use, we are going to look to what is existing. And you know we we very easily kind of kind of look towards the FAA advisory circular around heliport designs guidance um, the 150-5392C um, as well as the NFPA 418 um, any and all you know state and local applicable building codes um, will will remain valid uh, and will be used you know as needed. So let's. Um, Let's be briefly speak a little bit about the design process, and um, I know Chuck did talks talk some of this, and there's there's a lot going going on here on this slide, and and you know really I'm not I'm not going to go through each step of this, but really the point of of this illustration um, is that uh, there's a lot of work to do, um, and there is still a lot of work to do. We've been working on this for a little while, and we barely kind of scratched the surface at the very beginning. Um, it's it's a huge effort, uh, and as Chuck outlined. You know, previously there's there's a lot of input coming from a number of different uh, sectors uh, that will help you know kind of define and develop and make this successful. Um, so what this is, this is a V model. Uh, you might be familiar, uh, some of you, uh, but generally you know this is something that's used for software development. But I, I I look at this and I see you know a lot of similarities kind of in the technical aspects of the project cycle that we're going through when we're when we're concepting and, and developing the concept you know for skyport design and development you know you look across the top line of 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 the illustration um and this is a fairly typical timeline i, I guess if you will um where you know for architectural and design and development where you start with concept and planning and uh scoping and, and due diligence and preliminary final design into construction so fairly fairly typical you know development uh, timeline but Nothing about what we're doing now or what we're approaching with Skyport design development is typical at all. Um, it doesn't exist. It's it's completely new. It's a it's brand new product. Uh, it's it's going to be full of you know brand new leading edge you know, technology that is still being developed. Uh, and and so so this is much more difficult and this is much more challenging you know of of a concept that we're going through. And so you know and it, how we're looking at it is is this entire process is requirements driven. You know, and it starts with the identification of, you know, the user requirements. And that's 
our requirements for Skyport operations. That's our requirements for vehicle interface. That's our requirements for the passenger experience, uh, and so on. You know, including you know <laughs> federal and local you know guidance and, and regulatory uh, requirements uh, and and community acceptance requirements. So you know, right now you know we are only on the very top left-hand side you know of this of this image. You know, kind of in that feasible. St feasibility study and concept development uh, and and as we as we start to work through you know our requirements we're defining you know that complete list uh, of requirements I and mean, we're starting to move down the left hand side of the V you know what we're doing is we're defining and we're decomposing those requirements we're pulling them apart you know individually solving for those requirements as as we see you know the need and as as we're solving for them you know we're then moving on uh, to the next and, and kind of working our way down through the V. Um, so it's identification and verification and validation. And, and this continues on until, you know, we feel that, you know, we've exhausted, you know, a complete list of requirements. Uh, and we can we can hit the bottom of the V and we can start going up the right hand side. And as we're going up the right hand side, we're we're recomposing uh, and, and putting it back together. We're we're reintegrating, you know, those requirements into our design concept. Uh, and all the while, you know, as we're going through this recomposing and, and integrating, you know, again, we're doing another check and validation of verification of those requirements to make sure that they are still uh, valid and that we've still solved for them, you know, correctly. Um, that's getting us, you know, as we're as we're moving up the right hand side, that gets us, you know, into you know construction, final design through construction and, and into completion. Um, and one thing one thing to note is that you know really um, you know there's probably not just going to be one movement or one V you know, flow as we go through this process, you know, it's very likely that there'll be a couple waves, you know, this will be more of like a wave image as we go through this, because you can see potentially as we're going up the right hand side of the V and we're integrating, you know, there could be a change in regulation, there could be an advancement in technology, there could be completely revision in the requirements set that we previously re uh, defined. And if that is the case, then, you know, we're, we're kind of like backing up, starting over, going back to the top, you know, the left hand side and, and resetting uh, around that new set of requirements and kind of working through that. So, so we'll continue to kind of kind of follow this process as we go. Um, and what's what's great, you know, this really ties back to, again, what, what uh, Chuck was alluding to and the many different teams and consultants uh, that will need to have input here. So, um, Let's get into some of the good stuff. You know, many many of you have, have seen this imagery before. You know, it was on some previous slides and previous presentations. You know, a lot of this, you know, has been put forward with some of our uh, work that's been put forward from our partners, um, and that uh, in, in prior years. And uh, and these are ultimately really the the future of where we want to go. You know, this is this is our aspirational existence, if you will. Uh, this is not necessarily where we see ourselves starting from, right? Um, but what's important is that we know where we want to go this is where we want to be and i think that's that's really important because um you know when when at the beginning you know when we we referenced or i started to talk about you know existing infrastructure these early you know forward looking concepts really help us you know work backwards into a simpler approach uh, and launch if you will um, because all of these you know uh, all of these concepts they really started the same way uh, and around the same way that we're we're continuing to look at this now with with a concept and a set of defined requirements that they needed to solve for and this is this this was the output that they came they came with, um, and so so some of the early work with with you know these concepts you know really started you know at the top starting at the top thinking about you know the configuration uh, and operational concepts of the facility you know where is the fado uh, how how what what is the spatial uh, requirements of of the TLOF and the fado and the safety areas and and what is the organizational you know uh, of the of the parking of the vehicles and how are we managing uh, the vehicles you know after they've landed and and what's their relationship you know with each other so we're back at the beginning and defining some of the basic layout assumptions of everything um, Everything that we're we're starting with, you know, is is based on our uh, our vehicle reference model that that you see here. This is what this really is is our common reference model, uh, and we're and we're using this 
um, as our base model so that we can begin, you know, begin with this from kind of uh, size and weight, maneuverability, uh, general vehicle operations. Like this is helping helping us, you know, guide the requirements for the for the vehicle itself. Uh, and what's important to note here is that we really do see, you know, our common reference model is broadly covering the requirements, you know, of our partner vehicles that are that are also uh, in development currently. So here we are, um, you know, we're um, using that that vehicle reference model uh, to start to uh, define um, define our layout and and, and starting with our TLOP. Uh, initially and, and sizing our TLOP around that vehicle uh, and, we're, and we're sizing our TLOP at a, at a 50 foot diameter initially um, you know this is you know this ties back to uh, our maximal uh, vehicle dimension and, and you know in the uh, design guidance we have um, you know reference to kind of a rotor uh, diameters and, and and knowing that you know EV tools are, are very much different um, you know, we kind of will, you know, take the interpretation of going to, you know, a 50 foot minimum uh, or that maximal dimension of our vehicle and that 50 feet from wingtip to wingtip or from nose to tail uh, is where we're landing at. Uh, and then next, uh, our FATO, uh, based on that, based on, you know, the existing guidance, you know, one and a half times that maximal vehicle dimension and that takes us to a 75 foot uh, diameter FATO for these vehicles. And then finally, uh, safety. The safety area around the fatal it's equal to one third that maximal dimension uh, of the vehicle and that takes us you know roughly to a little over 100 uh, 108 feet so um, now that we have uh, the, the fatal defined um, we, we start start thinking about parking uh, and we start thinking about where the vehicles are going to go after they've landed uh, and and how we're arranging those uh, parking spots or parking pads uh, each parking space you know is is a 50 foot diameter so again that's equal to the tlop or equal to our our vehicle maximal dimension um, and then the safety area around uh, the parking pad is a 60 foot diameter uh, or that 10 foot minimum um, one thing to note is that uh, at we expect that after the vehicle has landed, uh, that the movement of the vehicle on the ground after landing, you know, will be completed by ground control or taxi and not a movement that uh, is under the vehicle's own power. Uh, and that allows us to be a little more flexible, uh, certainly, you know, uh, with efficiency um, and, and managing managing the ground control, uh, as well as uh, some of the safety uh, setbacks and requirements that that are reflected those those controls. Um, you know, some of the other factors we take into account, you know, around the parking is is the distance between the parking and the, and the FATO safety area, the distance from the center of the FATO to the center of the parking pad, and also kind of their angular um, separation. You know, so that is that is that array that's kind of kind of built around the the FATO or the TLOF, um, and then so that angular angular separation of those parts. So um, we think about these configurations and the relationship um, uh, between the FATO and the parking pads, and we come up with something you know that you're seeing here. You know, a bear claw configuration, if you will. Um, this is you know based on our studies as as we've analyzed this. You know, this is this is space efficient. This is operationally efficient. And, and absolutely this is flexible enough and adaptable enough to fit with a number of different applications. And so when we think of you know, various applications as, as you know, alluded to earlier, you know, the existing uh, infrastructure that we would like to repurpose. And as we, as we think of some of the existing infrastructure, parking garages is something that comes up you know, a lot. Uh, and, and which is great about it is that parking garages is existing infrastructure, really that's everywhere. Uh, and typically with parking garages, you're going to see the top level of those garages, you know, very much underutilized, uh, if if at all. Uh, and and another great thing is that we see that parking garages generally fit, you know, our base level uh, structural requirements and space requirements um, for uh, for the integration of our use. And so, um, you know, on the left-hand side, you know, there's two uh, two versions here. There's a number of different varieties of parking garages, but you know. For instance, you know, you have, you know, the two on the left, you know, they are uh, large, flat, 
wide open slab configurations that are great, ideal. You know, these are essentially a home run for for our you know integration. Uh, and then on the right, you know, we have some which which are also quite common uh, split level garages or a ramped floor uh, garage. And so a couple of different approaches, you know, as we as we think about these uses, uh, is that we are then modifying our configuration one to either fit and work with the level slab that is available or the level space that is available or you know then start thinking about potentially building an elevated structure or an elevated flight deck above the ramp sections to create a flat level surface for us to operate from so um, incorporating some of these different types of facilities um, you know we come up with a number of different configurations and and you know when we when we started with that bear claw based model you know what's great about it is it allows us to continue to to be flexible and play with the layouts um, and and the building shape you know really helps helps us define you know what some of these configurations can be um, you know we also see an operational uh, relationship between the number of parking pads and a fado and and whether that's you know a, a fado and four to five parking pads you know as we as we as we extend past that we 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 see the need for for an additional fado uh, to increase and support you know kind of that that increased operational capability um, so uh, so again it, it comes comes back down to you know the types of facilities uh, that we are incorporating in so we'll go back to a basic layout uh that that we were showing and and here i have our t law and our fado and our safety area based on kind of the dimensions we spoke about earlier the parking pads you know generally in the array you know alignment that we that we showed earlier uh and then using our common reference model you know vehicle there for scale and this is all this is all to scale this reflects you know about a 50 to 60 thousand square foot area uh and this is this is this is a very real application and and this you know size of building and size of structure is a commodity that, that really is pretty common you know, uh, out there for existing infrastructure. So this is something uh, that we see as very real. What we haven't, you know, touched on, which probably will take an entire, you know, another session here, is is the terminal uh, and the terminal experience. And so working very much on this, and this is this is, you know, a bit of a representation of, of some early concepting ideas. You know, this is a terminal space. You know easily deployable, easily reconfigurable, easily adaptable to any, you know, type of situation uh, and able to fit within kind of any scenario. So um, that's kind of like layout and general operational uh, thoughts and considerations. Uh, and then we move into, you know, very importantly is the vehicle interface and and again scratching the surface here with vehicle interface uh, a lot more work to do here but as we as we continue to, to work with our partners and understand you know that list of requirements and we go back to you know how we're going through this design process we're collecting those requirements and then we're starting to kind of weave that into uh, into our concept design so um, we're thinking about charging uh, charging the early infrastructure, we're, we're expecting to provide up to 400 kilowatts DC fast charging at each parking position. So, so every parking pad, every vehicle that's landed and parked, you know, has its own charger. So within that scenario, uh, you know, of a, of a single FATO and four parking pads, you know, we expect multiple vehicles that are going to be charging at the same time. And so as that translates into the infrastructure requirements, we, we can estimate a, a total peak load requirements up to about eight megawatts. Uh, and with that, you know, situation you know we really then you know that kind of you know pushes us to think about you know the use and design of behind the meter battery storage and what that's going to do is that's going to reduce our peak demand uh you know for power and stabilize kind of the utility draw and some of those systems you know that we see that you know work very easily for that you know is a three to five megawatt system uh of of uh, battery storage and and these are these are elements that that exist already and so there is there are product and there are solutions for this already so now it's a matter of kind of incorporating that into our design thermal management i think thermal management is a big uh element um that uh, that needs to be provided and and when we think of uh, battery thermal management you know we really you know it's it's to ensure that the battery cells you know are remaining kind of in in a desired temperature range you know while they're parked and charging uh we we need to minimize the cell to cell you know temperature variations uh we need to prevent the battery from going above or below kind of the acceptable limits and, you know and really maximizing the useful energy you know 
know, from the cells in the pack, you know, as well as, you know, mo quite important, you know, is that it will also contribute significantly to the battery health and extend its overall lifespan. Um, also with the uh, thermal management, you know, we think of cabin, uh, cabin climate control, um, you know, really just to maintain a comfortable climate in between operations. And, you know, what that translates to is, is what we're thinking about is, okay, we, we have a couple of different systems here. They're going to need to be separate chilling systems, uh, you know, and for, uh, for each vehicle. Uh, and, you know, whether the, the battery thermal management is liquid or air cooling, uh, you know, for that, that's really going to be defined by the vehicle design. Uh, but there will be, you know, a level of base, you know, building infrastructure that, that will be provided and then can be adapted and configured, you know, for each use. Uh, and then for cabin climate controls, assumptions right now is it's largely just going to be a forced air uh, HVAC system that can be connected uh, to to kind of either cool or or, or heat the cabin. And then lastly, um, uh, passenger access. Um, you know, really just thinking about a safe, easy vehicle access and, and passenger movement from the terminal uh, to the vehicle, and and you know making sure that it's not obstructed by any of these other interfaces. And you know, clearly, you know that's that's translates to, you know, needing to make sure that we have a clear path of travel, you know, intuitive wayfinding, correct vehicle identification, um, you know, and, and access to the vehicle really is going to vary by by each vehicle design. Uh, but, but again, keeping, keeping in mind that, you know, that path um, to the vehicle and that path to the parking pad, you know, remains consistent and it needs to remain clear. So, so any of the other interfaces and any of the other infrastructure that needs to be in place for the vehicle, you know, we, we have to make sure that we're not obstructing kind of, uh, that passenger and pilot access, uh, to the vehicle. So, you know, uh, the, the vehicle interface and, you know, again, this is something that probably takes another, another full session on its own as we as we start to define those requirements um but certainly um this is this is where we are now and we're continuing to kind of you know collect that information and, and continue to define and refine uh our development as we work through so um that is that is you know i would say a, a fairly high level you know kind of review of of what we're thinking about and how we're thinking about it and where we're approaching um and and companies like uh psns and and others that we're partnering with um you know is 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 great to to see that you know we're we're definitely aligned uh in in where we see our priorities and and how we need to continue to drive you know uh through these concepts and and through these solutions um so that's uh, that's where we are today. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was terrific. Um, and our last speaker is Darshan Devakaran. Uh, Darshan is a technology evangelist, entrepreneur, aviator, and keynote speaker with expertise in unmanned aviation, aviation development, flight operations, airborne safety, remote sensing, geospatial analysis, and program management. <laughs> He is presently an executive aviation consultant for Aerospace Arizona Association, where he leads efforts to work with federal government, state and local agencies, public safety agencies, industries, and academia to integrate a statewide UAS. Previously, he was an executive aviation consultant for the North Carolina Department of Transportation's Division of Aviation. Uh, Darshan is also the founder and president of Aerobat LLC, a company that focuses on education, training, and outreach to government, industry, universities, and nonprofits all over the world on leveraging emerging technologies. Uh, please welcome Darshan. Hey, good afternoon, Yolanka, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think it's the, uh, there's a curse of the last speaker always, so I hope uh, I don't go over time and uh, I'll stick to the presentation. So. Uh, so about 55% uh, of the world's population uh, live in urban areas, and that uh, figure is expected to rise to 68% by 2015. So we know that, uh, you know, we are living in a increasingly uh, uh, urban environment. Uh, so we are becoming a citizens of the urban world. Now, in the last few year, uh, months, really, in the last month or two, we have seen a lot of initiatives towards urban air mobility. Uh, and uh, advanced air mobility with NASA uh, and uh, Agility Prime. Uh, but one of the things that we have to highlight uh, also this year was when uh, Secretary Chao uh, uh, spoke at the World Economic Forum uh, about UAM, and she highlighted one key thing, uh, which is uh, UAM technology must first win the public's trust and acceptance. So this is a big driving force 
uh, for integration uh, as uh, you know industry and regulate uh, uh, regulatory bodies are working towards uh, you know the uh, framework for UAM and how it has to advance the path forward. Uh, it's very important for states, uh, you know, the state integration part uh, to uh, you know in, uh, build the public's trust. So uh, that is a key initiative uh, and key importance uh, for uh, you know state integration. And that brings us to you know the question about you know why urban air mobility. So as I mentioned, you know we uh, you know by 2050 the population in the urban environment is going to be 68 percent. We are already growing. Uh, as fast as possible, there's a limited amount of space. Uh, this is not just in US, but all around the world. So this is a problem which is uh, being identified that, okay, now what do we do? Uh, how do we move about, uh, you know, reduce the traffic congestion? And as you know, in um, the three major uh, cities in the United States, Boston, uh, Washington, DC, and Chicago, uh, they are known for uh, being the worst states for congestion. Uh, and uh, you know, if you talk about numbers, uh, last year we had $87 billion in loss. Uh, that is estimated about 1,348 per driver uh, because of traffic. And this really is a driving and a motivational factor for states. Uh, you know, this will, uh, urban air mobility can help, uh, uh, you know, change this numbers improve the states in a big way and already there are many initiatives with smart city uh, smart cities and stuff there they're talking about uh, uh, unmanned vehicles autonomous ground uh, you know uh, ground based vehicles and everything so we are already in that uh, sector of uh, uh, or the that stage or uh, where we know that urban air mobility uh, will help and now it's all about how do we get this in place so if we are looking at uh, you know the countries what's happening uh, you can see that a lot of great initiatives are happening especially in Europe uh, you know Europe is driving a UAM in a big way uh, the European cities are part of the uh, the European innovation partnership in smart cities and communities that is the EIP SPC and that is along with uh, this initiatives along with the uh, sky ATM that the Cessor joint undertaking for uh, drone traffic management these are Great initiatives happening in um, Europe, but also in China, we are seeing a lot of initiatives there. Uh, and it's it's every country is now talking about urban air mobility in some concept, and uh, that is really a great thing. But uh, a lot of eyes are on US and how we uh, bring this uh, technology and this uh, be integrated smartly within our states, and uh, you know take the benefit of it. So. It's not that uh, we're just starting with UAM, uh, you know, uh, in the last few months or last few years. It's been a discussion uh, ongoing and, you know, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, currently states are already working towards some form of a UAM or you, you can even say UAS, but some form of UAM concept. And uh, in 2017, with the integration pilot program, the U.S. integration pilot program, uh, we, ha we were able to see how states could play a big role. Uh, in uh, unmanned systems integration. And, you know, uh, with that, we started talking about detect and avoid technology beyond visual line of sight. We saw connectivity issues being discussed, uh, package delivery, part 135. A lot of good things came out of the integration pilot program, but a lot of, uh, you know, discussions also came about states' role and how states uh, need to integrate unmanned systems. So, UAM is an ongoing thing which we have to uh, talk about and this is where uh, integration uh, at a state level is important and what uh, are the challenges uh, for states but also the challenges that need to be addressed by the industry are um, you know infrastructure we know that uh, so so just to think about the national airspace is is going to be impacted by urban air mobility but we are already talking about small us and how that is impacting the national airspace. So we have to now figure out in the urban air mobility side, uh, what are the challenges and how do we overcome it? And this is a uh, this is uh, has to be figured out by both sides. The state has to start planning as well as the industry and the regulatory body and organizations need to be helping. So we need to be talking about infrastructure. We need to talk about the certification standards. Uh, if uh, you know the small US has given us enough of lessons that. Uh, with poor certification standards early on in 2014-2015 uh, and uh, so this should be a lesson that in urban mobility we have to 
uh, get this right. Uh, communication, yes, we have to talk about detect and avoid. We have to talk about connectivity, the 5G connectivity, or beyond uh, regulations. We have to start seeing how uh, some of the older regulations can be modified. Some of the new regulations can benefit uh, not just uh, urban and mobility, but small US and everything uh, thereon. And then the other challenges we have to talk about are battery, noise, weather, security. So these are challenges that are uh, in, uh, that need to be addressed from both sides. Uh, for that, we also have to understand the autonomy levels. And you know, uh, if we are talking about uh, autonomous operations, we have to understand uh, how it's going to move and how it's going. Uh, how states also have to understand uh, where the uh, path forward is. So presently, we operate drones basically on level one and level two, uh, where pilots are still responsible and have control. And level three uh, is where pilots are going to be uh, a fail phase. So this is where the uh, UAM uh, in a big way is influenced, where pilots are still on board, but the pilots are uh, only there to monitor the progress and uh, a fail safe. And level four and five is where the whole UAM industry or the whole UAM, uh, you know, even in small US, uh, that is a key driving force for uh, getting, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, you know, our results right, I would say. So level four and level five is where we have to be working on in autonomous systems. The UAM maturity level, so uh, everyone's aware about uh, this, which, uh, you know, this was created by NASA to help understand the path forward. Presently, we are at the initial uh, stage uh, of demo, uh, you know, initial stage where uh, we're talking about aircraft certification, testing, community demonstrations, and uh, you know, a uh, lot about public uh, acceptance. So that's the thing. The level one, uh, the initial stage, that is the uh, one UML one and two, uh, uh, are are the focus where we have to talk about public acceptance. That is a big driving force there. And then we talk about the intermediate side where we are working right now, uh, uh, that is on establishing UTM, uh, weather tolerant operations, you know, talking about hundreds of flights. And then, uh, you know, the mature stage, that is the UML five and six is where we are, uh, there is the future that is autonomous and remote operations and then high density UTM. But to achieve that, we have to make sure that uh, the initial stage, that is the public acceptance, is being uh, you know discussed about demonstrations are being done data is being collected uh, and you can see through the pilot programs the, the ICC uh, there are a lot of um, community outreach initiatives taking place uh, with the nine states uh, they are getting uh, feedback from this and FA is uh, FA and USDOT are, are looking into this to understand uh, what level of acceptance is there. So how do we, uh, you know, where we are and what we ha are doing right now and basically where UAM is. So we, uh, we are talking about key players. These are manufacturers, regulators, you know, technology innovators. Uh, we're talking with state and local uh, leaders and investors. Uh, they, uh, the folks who are going to build the infrastructure and everything. So all these discussions are already taking place. And these are part of the smart city and also uh, future of air transportation. So that's being done. Then the concept of UAM. We are, in the part of concept of UAM, we're already seeing package delivery, we're talking about disaster response, uh, weather monitoring, uh, and then uh, you know news gathering. So these type of uh, concepts are being integrated from where we have to show positive uh, impact and uh, let the public know about it. Uh, every every good news should be highlighted, should be bought, uh, you know, should be spread around. Uh, and companies that are based in these states uh, that are you know, building this technology or integrating uh, or wanting to integrate this technology have to start talking about uh, the positive impact for, for UAM and if from UAS to UAM. Uh, and then in the innovation technology side, we're already seeing autonomy, artificial intelligence, data analytics, you know, electric uh, propulsion systems are changing the way we travel. Uh, even the ground-based transportation is changing. So these are stuff that we are at right now. So when you talk about safety, you know, uh, flying is one of the safest way to travel. And then accomplishing this uh, took the airline industry decades. But uh, for UAM, it will be expected to meet these uh, or ex exceed these standards in a much shorter amount of time. So 
uh, safety is going to be key. Uh, showing the safety to the states is important. Uh, explaining, uh, you know, it, it's not when I say safety, it's not just the aircraft safety, but there's a lot of other stuff. Even the concepts we are talking about, the technology uh, have to show safety. Have to we have to put safety as the highlight of this. And then we have to talk about passenger safety as well as people on the ground, how they're going to be safe. Uh, we have to talk about, uh, you know, uh, taking, you know, the traditional commercial aviation safety standards and either, bet, you, know, uh, you know, integrating that or making it better. And then we have to also make sure the regulations are, uh, you know, supporting this uh, uh, safety and the new technologies. And then, you know, we always have to have uh, uh, fail safes, uh, you know, emergency uh, uh, technology, uh, you know, em emergency procedures and all, we have to show that safety. So all these things have to be discussed with states. They have to be bought into uh, in, in discussion with the public to show how they're going to be safe uh, when, uh, you know, uh, on the ground. So these things, uh, is, uh, this is an important part of uh, UAM. Uh, UAM infra infrastructure, we have heard such great presentations today about infrastructure and uh, you know, uh, how many of uh, folks, uh, you know, have worked with states uh, and with states. Uh, these, uh, this is an important thing because not all states uh, are advanced in the uh, unmanned system side. There are still states catching up. So a lot of these states are overlooked into the discussion. But, you know, if companies are based in these uh, uh, specific states uh, and are, are not getting the, uh, you know, getting the right, uh, introduction to the uh, entities in that state, they have to work a little harder because this is where when you talk to an infra infrastructure, we are, we have to involve the state in this discussion, the state, local, federal inputs, a lot of things have to be taken into. So uh, the uh, industry, the organizations that are part of these states will start, have to start talking to the uh, state leaders in this, showing them the benefits of this, uh, talking to them about why, uh, you know, where this needs to be positioned, how it's going to benefit the people, uh, and then uh, what are the, uh, you know, in case of uh, uh, some issue, emergency, uh, where are the uh, backup systems, you know, what are the landing locations, uh, you know, noise considerations all have to be taken and need to be educated to state agencies. And uh, let me in, uh, mention one thing clearly that states, uh, the state agencies like DOTs and other organizations, like it could be a public safety agency, all uh, uh, need this education because uh, when we, uh, you know, when we talk to many of these uh, agencies, we see that their uh, understanding to this is pretty much limited to drone delivery, and they don't know beyond that. So when we talk about infrastructure, it's very important to bring them into the discussion as well. Uh, UTM, I'm not going to be uh, spending too much time on this one, but UTM is important uh, if. Uh, States need to integrate, uh, you know, uh, 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 UAM. Then we need to mention. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we have uh, UTM figured out. Uh, if we have, uh, we have already started pilot project. We are talking about some level of UTM also. So these things have to be highlighted, uh, and we need to get this right. Uh, and already NASA, SA, and many other key organizations are working uh, together to solve this uh, with remote ID and everything. So uh, UTM is going to be a big driving force. And when we talk about UA, uh, UTM, we have to talk about the UM air traffic management also, which is uh, basically a UTM. But uh, right now the hurdles that the states are going through is integrating small UAS into the UTM. And uh, that is uh, one of the big roadblocks that needs to be addressed. Uh, and if we address that, then integrating UAM will be much uh, uh, easier and uh, safer. Uh, and that is something which uh, needs to be addressed right now. Discussions, uh, you know, demos, uh, pilot projects need to be integrated. And now on the UTM uh, side for small US where we have pa uh, package delivery and everything, uh, showing the safety disaster response. So. Uh, you know, in the UAM side, what components need to be uh, and consideration need to be taken are congestion management, uh, scheduling, uh, separation between aircraft, interoperability, uh, disruption management, contingency response management, and the complex UAM operations. All these have to be uh, integrated into the UAM air traffic management. 
Now, uh, you know, with all this information, you know, what states need to do, and this is also what industry and organizations have to uh, help out is, uh, how do, uh, first of all, the public-private partnerships. Uh, if states have not yet created these partnerships, they have to work towards it. Uh, there are organizations in respective states that are talking about UAM, are working on the UAM concepts, or there are companies based there, they have to start approaching uh, the state agencies and starting to talk about uh, these partnerships. Uh, you know, working with FAA, USDOT, and other uh, entities to create, uh, make sure that the regulatory requirements are done on the BBLS side, operations of people, they are tested uh, say, uh, and proven, uh, you know, modernizing the infrastructure. Like I said, if we are building infrastructure, we have to uh, first see what uh, infrastructure exists that can be utilized and then uh, talk about building newer infrastructure. And then um, on the uh, regulatory framework needs to be created for UAM, uh, UTM, uh, statewide UTM needs to be integrated. Uh, solving the issue of connectivity, very important. Uh, universities are doing research on it right now. Companies are spending uh, billions of dollars towards this connectivity issue and uh, spectrum allocation. That needs to be uh, you know, addressed. Uh, remote ID, uh, ID integration has to be done with public safety. Uh, public safety has to be brought into this discussion. Uh, counter US, very important. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's a lot of times confused with military and stuff, but counter US is uh, a key to this. Uh, when we have vehicles that are flying, uh, you know, as per mission, as per, uh, you know, uh, uh, authorization, uh, they need to be protected from aircraft uh, or other entities that are not, uh, uh, you know, are permitted to be in that airspace. So counter US plays an important role. Uh, standardizing the training. Uh, we are lacking, uh, we, are, we lack standard, uh, you know, states are, don't have a standardized training uh, for their agencies. Uh, everyone's doing their different version of training. So that needs to be addressed. Uh, community outreach, very important. And it has to be, uh, you know, I feel every week or two, there has to be discussions uh, or uh, positive impact that we need to show the community on uh, urban air mobility, UTM. US, so community outreach is important, so you need to reach out to organizations in the states that are working on that. Finally, uh, community air mobility initiative. Uh, I'm an expert contributor for this. Uh, as Yolanka mentioned, uh, what uh, CAMI does, uh, this is a, a great organization that uh, you know can work with these uh, state, uh, with the states, with the industries to create that partnerships, to create that education. So uh, you know, if you haven't reached out, it's good to reach out. You have uh, experts in different areas that can help out. And that's pretty much it. So I went overboard by 10, five minutes, I think. But yes, thank you. Darshan, thank you very much. Thanks for that shout out to Cami as well. Um, we have gone over time. And so I'm, I'm hearing from Vertical Flight Society that we will not be able to have a live Q&A today. Um, however, uh, they, uh, Vertical Flight Society will post uh, the presentations, the complete video, and the questions with answers uh, by the end of the week on their website. So once again, I want to thank our uh, fabulous panelists uh, for uh, their presentations. Uh, thank PSNS uh, for sponsoring this webinar and Vertical Flight Society for organizing this uh, great series on uh, eVTOL infrastructure. Uh, I hope all of you have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>